Episode 57, Chef Fit Podcast. Attitude is everything. Hope we're good. Hope we're well. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Katie, what's the crack? All good, homie. A quick reminder, like, subscribe, five-star review. Get involved. Get on it. Um, yeah, before, before, we, play, before we forget. Yeah, exactly. Just do us all a favor. Uh, if you listen to the podcast, you fucking post it regularly or you're listening to it in the kitchen, you're listening to it at home or on your commute somewhere, um, please show some support. We need your help. Um, show any kind of support by liking it, subscribing to the channel you're listening to it on, whether that be Podbean or YouTube, and share it on social media or send it to a mate. And uh, yeah, that will help us massively. What do you listen to podcasts on? What do I, I usually, to be honest, Mostly. my thing has always been YouTube. I used to listen to podcasts on my commute. Now, the only time I listen to podcasts is through YouTube. Um, the odd time, it might be in the gym. But to be honest, I'm a bit of a fucking cretin. I can't. If I'm listening to a podcast in the gym, like I can't focus myself to do something high intensity, let's say. Like I need gotcha. gyms. Yeah. Whereas if I'm in the gaff, after I finish work, that'll be, you know, whether it's Joe Rogan, I've been loving fucking Mike Tyson's podcast for the past while now. I think it's hilarious. Um, that and a couple of others, generally anything that, uh, not just, I'm a bit bored of Joe Rogan these days, but even all his mates, <clears throat> Joey Diaz and all of those guys and all fucking shit. I'll go through phases, you know, I watched, I listened to three or four in a row. I, most of the time I listen to them on Podbean. And then if it's on in the house, like if I'm cooking, I'd like to put it on in the telly in the background. Yeah. Well, my absolute, my, my two favorite podcasts, one I've been listening to, it just had its 11th anniversary. It's called PKA, right? Painkiller already. And that is, um, it's, it started off as, as gaming, but it's nothing to do with gaming anymore. And then the other one is Nerd Poker. Did I tell you about Nerd Poker before? No. <laughs> no? Oh, man. It's like, we're into like episode. We're on episode. I think we're on episode sixty-eight of like the fourth season. Each season has about a hundred episodes, right. and it's 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 Dungeons and Dragons, right? And your man that hosts it, or that, he doesn't host it. A different dude hosts it. But your man that owns it, his name is Brian Pussain. He's an old school like sitcom writer. He's been on like um like the Sarah Silverman show and the Big Bang Theory and stuff like that. You know, it's just him and four not very well-known comedians playing Dungeons and Dragons. And it is, I, I swear to God, like I've nearly come off my bike laughing so much to this. Yeah. Oh, fucking hell, man. And then, of course, Infinite Monkey Cage is brilliant. Brian Cox. Yeah. Yeah, Brian Cox is fucking, um, so, he, he's the, he's, I'm, the, I'm, I'm half thinking the actor. Brian Cox is the fucking really, really intelligent fucking scientist yeah. guy who, who talks yeah. about places yeah. with that. Yeah, Fucking had a massive hand in in, uh, in CERN, in the Origin Collider. He has a podcast called Even the Moon Cage, and they're about 500 episodes in as well. Yeah. And they have, they had the, the guests that they have on, like they have like Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they always have like physicists, astronauts, and then they always have one British comedian on it as well. So perfect balance. Brilliant, brilliant podcast as well. Is it not too fucking, you can listen to it without, see the thing sometimes is. No, it's hilarious. It's funny. Like it's, it, it's, it's, it's always, yeah, there's, there's not a bad episode. Like. Interesting. That's fucking mad. Um, funny how it's kind of taken over as a, as a medium, you know, like I, I was thinking last night, me and Ella started watching the RTE would be the terrestrial channels. It's like BBC for the UK. Um, we were watching some series that came out recently about, uh, about a fucking a mother in America who Gypsy Rose was the kid's name, and she basically <laughs> mother convinced her uh, she has some disorder. She's a bit fucking mental. Um, the mother has a disorder where she creates a fictitious uh, disease and told her daughter about it from a young age. So the daughter is convinced that she has like she's paraplegic, so she's in a wheelchair. She's got a feeding tube. Um, she's bald because she has leukemia. But all of it was a lie. And the mother was telling what? all of this and shaving her head and fucking... I won't ruin it for you. The story is fucking mental. Anyway, the, it's a series that's out. What's it called, Ella? Uh, yeah. The Act. Um, it's oh, my God. Mad. But RT showed it. 
Um, but it was the first time we watched it last night. It was the first time I've seen ads on something, in, especially Irish ads. In- <laughs> <laughs> seen ads for like the lotto and the lotto. bored was gosh. Like, what the fuck is going I was googling. I was googling. I actually googled last night how to fucking pick good lottery numbers. Fuck. <laughs> the lotto goes two point eight million. Fuck you, Dabby. Get in. Get in there. Joe, we, when we moved out of the house before the last one, when, when like the landlord said, I'm selling the gaff, we moved into that place in Inchicore for about a year, and then we've been here for a year. Yeah. When we went into Inchicore, we said, right, this rent is uh, €550 Euros a month more than what we we're paying. So we're going to have to go without everything, right? And one of the things that went was, you still call it pipe, Cam. Pipe is gone. But the- that was our, Joe, come on, you're not that young, are you? What's the pipe? Pipe means RT1, RT2, ITV, <laughs> Channel 4, Sky 1, and MTV. Remember, pipe. Pull the pipe out. Put the pipe in. The, check the pipe. <laughs> 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 the wire that goes from the wall to the back of the telly. It's called a pipe. We didn't, get, we didn't get the pipe, right? We didn't get Sky. We didn't get, um, what was your other one? That became Virgin. It was three letters. Um, E4, Channel 4, that shit. You, you, no. <clears throat> UTV? No, 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 it's not that. It was a provider that did the internet and Virgin bought them over. We didn't, a UPC. That's the we one. didn't have them. That's the one. <laughs> we didn't get Sky, we didn't get UPC. And then when we moved out of there, we said, right, we, we haven't missed a single bit of telly. So mm-hmm. we're not getting it back in. And we still didn't. We just have Netflix. We just have YouTube and FIFA. That's all we need. Don't have it. That's a fucking fact. Don't have it anymore. It's bizarre. It's just like you used yeah. to fucking watch TV with ads. Don't watch it anymore at all. I was actually fucking taken back when the Lotto ad came on and I was Googling, you know. Getting on nostalgic. Yeah, fact. Anyway, folks. Let's, let's jump crazy. into it. Yeah, let's fucking go. We're going deep into the pipe there for a second. Um, <laughs> Attitude is everything. That's today's episode. And this is something that's really come... It's not something that's come to my attention recently. It's something that I've, that I've always known about. Um, and it's something that I feel holds the good majority of chefs back um, from success within their personal life and their lifestyle, um, potentially even success within their professional career. But I don't believe... Like, I believe a lot of chefs have a good attitude in the kitchen. Um, even not, not necessarily a good attitude, but <clears throat> they're willing to take on criticism because that's what you're kind of conditioned to do in the kitchen. And I'm not saying, and a massive disclaimer, is that a good attitude does not necessarily mean you take abuse from people. That's not at all what I mean, okay? Your attitude is your ability to take on something that helps you. That's what I'm referring to here, to take on something that helps you, whether that be help, advice, you know, information, something that helps you push forward. And I really feel the biggest issue that a lot of us will have in this industry, when you're beaten down by hours, you're beaten down by stress, beaten down by pressure, or maybe in your situation right now, you're beaten down by external factors. You're stuck at home, you're fucking broke. You know, all of these external things that are happening, you know, you can end up very much in a place where hard to describe but through being beaten by the industry you know and physically being in a bad place and being very very tired and very very fed up your attitude can be kind of a bit of a well i work extremely hard and i don't want to fucking hear anything to do with my lifestyle i don't want to hear anything to do with making a change and something i commonly get is you know whether it be flack whether it be a triggered comment whether it be people saying you know Oh, what the fuck are you talking about? Uh, People will generally react to something that I say or any kind of information that might help them. And that's a big, big problem. And I've forgotten my point there. I had a good point a second ago, but we'll keep pushing forward. Chef, Chef, because the actual thing is, in the kitchen, we build up a wall around ourselves. You have to to look hard, act hard, and then you use that wall Mm. to, to kind of steal yourself against all the shit that gets thrown on you. You don't know that it's getting thrown on you. You don't know that it's there. But you do have this attitude of, it's, it's, it's standoffishness yep. towards, towards life. And it goes into things that are good for you, but recommended from other people kind mm-hmm. of thing, or things that are good for you outside of the kitchen that wouldn't necessarily be good for how you look Absolutely. inside of the kitchen. 
You know what I mean? Not like a weakness exactly, but that kind of way. It's a hundred. That's absolutely fucking spot on. And I think everybody that works in that kind of environment has to develop some kind of, you know, tough exterior. Like it's a tough, it's a hard environment, you know, whether that be just fucking people talking shit to you and slagging you, you know what I mean? At the very bare minimum to, you know, getting scolded by your boss, or the head chef, or whoever the fuck's ahead of you. Do you know what I mean? That environment, you're conditioned to be defensive about things. And the reason that you're being defensive is because it's kind of the way that you get through it. You know, and that's the truth. It's a way of getting through it. The problem is <clears throat> that that standoffishness that you might have where you're defending yourself, whether that be defending a mistake or defending something within the kitchen, if you can carry that, if you carry that into your personal life, it can be the cause of a lot of problems. It can be the cause of a lot of problems. You know, and this is the whole idea of attitude is everything. The way that you think will ultimately determine the actions that you take, and those actions will determine the outcome of your life. I'll say that again. Your attitude determines the way that you think about things, and then the way that you think about things will determine the action you take, and then the action you take will determine the outcome of your life. So if you go straight back to the start, if you've got an attitude problem, well, you're going to have a life problem, you know? We've all worked for people. We've all, and I've, we've been, I've, I've been this person. I've been going to say, I've been there, done that. I've been this person. Um, I've met, I think I told this story before. I remember my, and I won't mention any names, but it was a restaurant my brother was involved in that me and my other brother, Aaron, were working in. I was managing the bar. And um, <clears throat> obviously when I was managing the bar, I'd have to keep a top, like I'd have to keep an eye on what our margins were behind the bar. The same way you'd be looking at food and saying, right, how many can I get out of this fucking thing that I'm buying, whether you're buying in a piece of meat, you know, or whatever. Like how many things, how, what can I maximize here? With booze, the yield. Yeah, exactly. Whereas, you know, in the bar, it was the exact same thing. You know, if I have a bottle of whiskey, that's fucking 20 servings. Cool, what's the money on that? I remember the people that we were involved in the restaurant with, we didn't get on well with at all. You know what I mean? So it was a bit of a divide. Me and my brothers versus these people were running the restaurant together. It was a fucking nightmare. Like it was a nightmare. And <clears throat> I always, you know, my whole life, if there's one trait that I'll admit that I have, it's that I have a good, I have a good fucking radar for people. You know what I mean? Like I can kind of suss people fairly quickly. And when I suss that someone's a bit of a fucking cockwomble or there's something not right there, my attitude can be quite bad towards them because I don't trust them. I don't think they're fucking worth, you know what I mean? I, I, I honestly, I have a problem with them. And the person in the restaurant who was working there with us, I had a problem with them. And I didn't know, think they knew what they were doing. And they were giving away booze behind the bar. And <clears throat> in that situation, my attitude just turned to, even though I might have been somewhat correct in my skepticism, my attitude just turned fucking deathy. Like I was, anyone that came near the bar and fucking applied any kind of pressure towards me, they were getting dead stares. I was having goes of people. I was a very, very, very negative bastard to be around. And um, because I was a negative bastard to be around, my brother had to fucking give me a disciplinary and we were living together. It was weird. And I remember the manager took me and he sat me down and he said, listen, man, like you're talented and you're good at what you do. But at the end of the day, like you're a six foot two man who's a hundred and fucking two kilos, 103 kilos. If you're standing behind a bar, you know, and someone's coming out, how do you think someone feels asking you for help? I was like, fuck. Uh, the, the, yeah, they're probably going to be a bit intimidated. And he's like, yeah, exactly. They're going to be fucking intimidated by it. You know, you, if you were in someone else's shoes, you wouldn't want to fucking work with you the way you're acting. And I was like, yeah, shit, you're right. And someone just told me that. And <clears throat> I might have experienced a period where I had a bad attitude, but in that moment, the facts were so overwhelmingly against my favor that I was like, fuck, you're right. You're actually spot on. Sorry. You know what I mean? And I have to sort that out. And in that place, all of us at some stage in the line, we've had that mentality where we're kind of reactive and we're fucking pissed off and we're angry and we're standoffish with people and we're looking for a scrap or we're looking for some kind of conflict. That conflict, even though a restaurant or whatever fucking service industry, you know, job you're in, yeah, sure, the emotions can run high. And when you're tired and when you're exhausted and when you're working fucking multiple long hour shifts, you know, you can get to a point where you just, you don't, you're fed up and you don't want to fucking take shit from people. And that's kind of fair enough. But it's when that... Especially in the moment, that's the big thing. Yeah. You know, it's not, it, it's, I always, I, 
And one way that I always used to calm my own chefs down when I was working as a head chef was, okay, so you are absolutely fuming now. This is like World War Three. You know, your one came in and asked for another bowl of rice and you already asked if she wanted more rice for the table and they said no. You know, I said, think about looking back at this in six months' time. How fucking stupid is, are, are you blowing a lid for that, you know? And it's always about in the moment, in the moment, in the moment. Exactly. For, for incidents like that, but that can build into an attitude so that you build up to that and then when you come in the next day, you're already ready for war. And I'd say that's where you were at that time, you know? You didn't start that job like that we are in that headspace you know what i mean it doesn't you don't wake up like that but the big thing is it's like you were spot on that that attitude can it can develop into an attitude that's applied into every part of your life and i think a lot of chefs can find themselves in that position where you've just been beaten down and you're fucking pissed off and you're fucking angry and you're not happy with where you're at and then that can carry into every interaction you have outside of work you know what i mean whether that's arguments at home whether that's, you know, fucking, I experience it all the time. I experience fucking chefs giving me shit over something I've said or whatever. And it's coming from a place of just like, oh, well, fucking my life shit and this is shit. And at the time when I was experiencing that and I was acting like a cunt, my life was shit. But I wasn't fucking doing anything about it at the time. Mm. And I had to check. You're spending more time in work than you are in not. So many times have you said, how you do anything is how you do everything. So if that's how you're doing everything at work, then that's the way you are. So oh, this is how I speak to people when I'm in work. Well, you're in work more than not. So that means this is how you speak to people. That's, you know what I mean? That's not okay. Again, and again, it's only because of where you are, what's going on. You're not going to go into the shop and just start off with someone goes, how are you? And go, oh, fucking go and ask me bollocks. I'm up to be tits. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's not the way it works. Like. And that was kind of my attitude outside of work as well. I can remember going home. Like I was living in the middle of Dublin but at the time and I remember driving home to Wicklow, which is outside Dublin where my family's from. I went to see my sister, you know, and I can actually remember that was one of the moments, you know, and she was asking me how I was and every answer was just like, I'm fucking shit. You know what I mean? Work shit, complaining about the people in work, complaining about what was going on. And it was like, uh, on my drive home, it kind of hit me of like, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you acting like this? That's not you, you know, you're being a fucking dickhead. And I was, I was being a dickhead. And I, you know, obviously I had to get checked by my manager and I sorted it out in work, but that didn't fix the problem. That was just meaning I was on my best behavior at work and I was trying to make an effort. But my attitude was still there. I still had a fucking chip on my shoulder. I still had this attitude of, you know, I'm fucking working harder than you. I'm fucking shit. You know, don't fucking ask me how I'm doing. You know, that was my mentality. And that's a really, really, really negative, horrible fucking place to be. And you got to understand something about your brain is that your brain, naturally, the default is to think of the negative, not the positive. And that's a survival instinct. Because we look at negative things, that's our way of mitigating danger. You know, so maybe in my mind, on a fucking instinctual level, on a primal level, those people that I had a problem with, I'm sensing danger. I'm sensing some kind of, you know, fuck. That's a real problem there. The rattling in the bush, assume it's going to kill you. Exactly. You know, so your brain is, uh, your brain is designed to sense danger and pick out negativity first. And positivity has to be a conscious effort. It has to be a conscious choice. Okay, trying to see the good in things has to be a conscious choice. Being nice to people usually has to be a conscious choice, you know, depending on the type of person you are. But for the most part, that's the crack. And <clears throat> my big thing is that a lot of people in this industry, you know, the attitude a lot of the time is that everything is the employer's fault, which is, I get it, I understand, because I think employers have a lot to answer for. But you can't just blame the employer and then do nothing yourself. There has to be a fucking happy medium. Do you know what I mean? We let the employers get away with it for so long. Yeah. So it's like the key thing here and the big problem that I see is that you know you're being mistreated, but you won't do anything. So instead of concentrating your efforts on trying to sort that situation out, whether that means sitting your boss down and going, listen, fucking, I'm not getting paid for the errors I'm doing or I'm not happy about this or voicing what you're concerned about 
instead of having that conversation or fucking putting your efforts into finding somewhere better, you know, instead of doing that, you'll stay in the same place, get abused. And then instead of saying something to them, you'll build an attitude that of negativity and, you know, self-pity. And that's the truth. Self-pity. I said, I pitied myself. I thought, you know, I felt sorry for myself. And in hindsight, it's ridiculous. It is. It's fucking ridiculous. And I don't buy it because at the time I might think I'm justified, but it's like, fuck, I put myself here. What am I talking about? You know, and it's not about pitying yourself and being the, it's, it's the fact that thinking like that will just make the problem worse. Thinking like that will accelerate time where it's like, I talked to people even way back then, six years ago, I remember working in a fucking place. It was a restaurant cafe where I was from and it was doing really well. And the two, the two fucking assistant, the managers on the floor were just a tiny bit older than me. And I remember that at the time they were just like negative. I fucking hate this job. I fucking hate this and I hate that. I can't wait to get out of here and do that. I went to eat there before I moved to Australia, which is five years later and uh, still there, still fucking around and still like, oh, this place is shit. It's man. What the fuck are you talking about? Get out of there. Like, do something about it. And that's not what people want to hear. And that's why my shit, my, like, things that I say through Chef It, through our message, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people can be triggered by what I say. And the reality is I'm telling you the truth a lot of times, but I'm exposing you to truth that hurts. And as I said, if you're in that situation of, you know, you have a bad situation at work and maybe you are being unfairly treated. Well, you can't expect that one day they're just going to turn around and treat you fairly. You have to fucking impact that situation. You have to sit them down and talk to them or you have to find something else. That's your two options. However, if you are not willing to fucking carry out that and sort it out, what you'll do is you'll stay exactly where you are. You'll continue to fucking do the same thing. You'll continue to be unhappy and the level of resentment will build in you and you'll become more and more attitudinal over time, which is, you know, living hell. That's hell, you know, showing up to something you hate, to work with people you hate, to fucking, you know, someone you're spite, you know, someone you're working for someone who you're spiteful against. That's not a good place to be, you know. That's not I didn't a- know that at the time, but I did that for four, four or five years. My last four or five years in the kitchens, I was like that. I didn't last a month before I hated the job I was in. Okay, 110%. And we spoke about that before, but the big thing that I want to tell you, and obviously Chef It is about sorting yourself out. It's about working on you and getting your lifestyle to a place where you're healthy, you know, you're positive, you're happy, you're living life in a way that fucking works for you. Um, you've got your confidence, you're managing your mental health, you're ma- by managing your physical health, you're remaining disciplined and you're changing your ways. You're undoing that chef programming that so many people have when they enter the industry because you are programmed to be unhealthy. It's a fucking circular hole into a square peg. But eventually, if you can fit the lifestyle in and you can get it done, it's a massive positive change. That's my message. That's why we're here. That's why Peter's here. That's why fucking over 250 chefs have been through the program and made changes. Some of them have been fucking life changing. And the whole idea is that that's the message and that's a positive way to go with things. Now, you got to understand that most people say they want those things. Most chefs will say they want to make a change. They want to lose weight. They want to feel healthier. They want this and they want that. But when it comes time to actually take on the information and do the work, they don't do it. And the reason for that is attitude. And it's this self-pity attitude that you might have within work is now being directed into what you're doing now, okay? Whether that be complaining about things, whether that be being triggered or having having self-pity. Like I had a comment the other day about, you know, complaining. And it's one of the biggest things I see within chefs that holds them back. And I remember describing my time you know, where I was in the shit and I was describing what my mindset was like and how I was complaining about this and that, but I never did anything. I never did anything. And I just kept digging, digging and digging. And it was until I had that conversation with my sister that it was so obvious to me what a fucking cockwomble I'd become that I had to change. I had to fucking sort it out. Now, I have chefs that will sit on the fence and, you know, will be triggered by something I say. And then I have chefs who go, actually, that fucking sounds about right. I'll jump in and I'll make it happen. 
And it's the people who are able to take the information on board and separate the good from the bad, because you're always going to have to do that. We live in a world now where everyone's triggered by fucking everything and everyone's so easily offended that you can't even say anything without hurting someone's feelings. The reality is you are going to have feelings hurt. If someone tells you the truth, it's, you know, yeah, sure, there are going to be feelings, but are you going to favor your ego and your self-pity over getting better? That's the question. Because if you favor your ego, what you'll do is you'll disregard what the person has said, even if it's fucking truthful. And then you say, fuck you, sure, look at you, fucking this and that. That's a terrible attitude. And that will stop you from doing anything positive in your life. Truth, absolute truth. I see it all the fucking time. And I don't say this because I'm speaking out of my arse. I say it because I see it in action. Every single day I show up to work. Chef it is the perfect example for it. The chefs who come in with the right attitude, the right mindset are the ones who change their life beyond a fucking shadow of a doubt. It's the reason why Peter's sitting there talking to me now on a podcast. It's because when the gauntlet was laid down, sorry, there's a bit of shit in my hair. When the gauntlet was laid down, it was like, he said, yeah, okay. Yeah, fuck it, let's go. You know what I mean? And he didn't, <clears throat> as much as he, you know, at the time I could have pointed some shit out and said, listen, this is what you're not doing, this is what you are doing. He just had a mentality of, well, I'm just going to fucking, you know, cool, whatever, let's get it done. And that was a, that's why he is where he is now. And that's why he's been successful. I've had a lot of chefs who, you know, will live in that place of, God forbid, you'd have to end my pity party. You know, I'm in a shit place and work so bad and this and that. And it's all about them. It's all about how bad their situation is. And then I... Well, I've shared in yours. Yeah, and I'd, I'd fucking dive a little bit deeper. And, you know, I see things like, well, your relationship is really struggling and, you know, your missus or, for the most part, it's lads who have this problem. Uh, your missus is fucking, you know, she doesn't even feel like she's in a relationship or a marriage with you because you haven't spoken to her in years. You haven't opened up to her. Um, and your mentality is she doesn't know what I'm going through. She doesn't know what it's like doing what I do. And it's like, of course she doesn't. Of course she doesn't. Why would she? You know what I mean? How could she? That's not her fault. Uh, that's not her fault. And the only reason I keep saying her and not him is because I've only ha I've only heard one side of that story. If there's female chefs out there, you know, who feel like they've done that to their fella, fair enough. I just haven't heard it yet. Um, but you know, you're expecting them to understand without ever explaining it to them. Your kids, it's like your situation so shit, and your life so shit, and your boss is such a dickhead. But then your kids have fucking grown up with someone who's not even bothered to play with them. In my opinion, the way I fucking see it is I feel sorry for the kids. I don't feel sorry for you because you could do something if you fucking tried. You could do something, but you're not doing something. And you're accepting the bullshit mentality that so many chefs have, which is I am a martyr to the cause, you know, and I'm going to fuck my, I'm going to sacrifice everything for service and team. Yeah. Again, a mentality that's not your fault. It's an industry problem across the board. And chefs are, you know, you're, you're pushed into thinking like that. So it's not your fault. But as I said before, it's your responsibility to fix it. And if other people are suffering as a result of your ways, whether that's friends, family, friends, not so much. That's not as important as family. You know what I mean? Family and relationships. If those things are being impacted and other people are being impacted by the fact that you're not willing to sort your situation out, I blame you, not them. I blame you, not work. Because you need to sort that out. And you can't expect someone else to sort it out for you. And that's the fucking truth. Big time. That's the truth. And <clears throat> as hard as that might be to hear, as hard as that might be to take on board, if you do take it on board and you have an attitude of, well, actually, fuck, that's probably right because my fucking home situation is shit right now and I can barely communicate within my relationship and I'm barely showing up as a role model. Or maybe I don't even have a relationship and I can't be bothered to create one. Regardless of what your situation is, you can take it, be triggered by it and say, fuck you, or you can take it on and you can go, right, well, that's actually true, so what can I do? You know, attitude determines both outcomes, okay? You can fucking choose to be triggered and say, fuck you, or you can choose to actually find a way to get it done, you know? And <clears throat> ultimately, the reason that this happens and the biggest part of being reactive and the, probably the biggest part of me getting flack, okay? And maybe people have listened to this, but maybe you're listening to it right now and saying he's a cockwomble, whatever, I don't really care. But it's like, 
whether you're looking at posts that we do or whatever, <clears throat> lifestyle is an alien thing to chefs a lot of the time. You know, no one's really looked into the industry and gone, okay, right, well, actually, lifestyle is a good way to address this problem, you know, and that's what we try and do. In that place, a lot of chefs can look at stuff when they're naturally ill-disciplined from being chef, as we all were in the industry, you know, naturally fall into some negative patterns. You build some bad habits. All of a sudden, you're real, you're real disciplined. And then you're listening to someone tell you to be disciplined. And because you're not ill-disciplined and they're pinpointing the fact that you could be better if you were disciplined, that triggers you. You're in a reactive state already. And because you're in a reactive state as a result of someone telling you a harsh truth, you'll stay stuck if you keep getting triggered by things instead of trying to find the good in them. And that's all down to mentality. All down to mentality. And <clears throat> I'll just backtrack a small bit. I remember when I first got out of the service industry and I remember I moved back to my mum's gaff and I was sleeping in the fucking box room. I had no money in my account. I remember I had like minus, I think I was fucking a hundred quid in overdraft in my bank account. <clears throat> I was getting a train and a bus into a gym in town in Dublin and I was working there for a hundred quid a week. You know, I was just fucking like close to eating ketchup sandwiches. You know, I might have actually attempted a ketchup sandwich at some point along the line. It was a very testing time in my life, but I knew it had to be done in order to get to where I wanted to be. You know, I wanted to be successful within <clears throat> the coaching space, within fitness and all of that. Um, and I was ready to fucking do whatever it took to get there. And I remember my first mentor, my first boss in the place he was working, he was a fucking, he was a, like, he was so good at what he did. He was so on the ball and he fucking knew what he was talking about that <clears throat> I was willing to tolerate the fact that he was a bully and a fucking asshole. <clears throat> and I'm not saying you have to tolerate bullying, okay? I'm not saying you have to tolerate bullying, but what I am telling you here is people would be triggered by my posts, but, you know, that's nowhere near what I was experiencing from this guy. I remember I was coaching people, and I was doing my best out on the floor. I was a new coach. And I was spotting a guy on bench press. And I was just supporting him along. I was like, okay, buddy, let's go. Push, 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 push. And he screamed across the floor in the middle of it, in front of a lot of clients. And he screamed across the floor, Cameron, come here. And he brought me into the office. And he's like, will you shut the fuck up shouting at that lad? You're fucking annoying him. It's not a fucking powerlifting competition, you fool. You know, and just that would be almost daily, that kind of, you know, bring you in, fucking give you a load of abuse, and then ship you back out. And I remember at the time, my mentality was whatever it takes to get better, whatever it takes to get better, whatever it takes to get better. I'm not going to let something stop me and I'm not going to let this fucking affect me. So I would just go, no problem, no problem. I think I, think I used to call him sensei, which is even worse. But I used to say, no problem. And I go back, back onto the floor and I do what he asked. And I remember getting a train home that night off a fucking 13 or a 14 hour shift. And I was reading a book called Mastery, which is a fantastic book that really was timely for me but in the book you know he talks about this apprenticeship stage and you've got to be willing to take shit on to get better you got to be willing to take shit to move forward and for me at the time that was my mindset of even though he might be wrong there's some truth in what he's being is being said so when instead of my ego being triggered and me going well fuck him he's a dickhead he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about I then had to dial that in and go, what is he trying to tell me? What am I, what can I take from this situation to get better? And that's a very hard mentality to have. And that's something I had to fucking really drill into myself because this is, you know, a very different story from Cameron a few years previous who was fucking screaming at people walking by. So you're saying to yourself, like, regardless of how he said it to me, yeah. is, there some, is there something that I can take from that to better myself? Exactly. And in that time, it's probably the biggest period of growth I've ever had in my life in that year, year and a half I was there. And it was because I just showed, the, I just showed up like a fucking professional and I put my fucking head down and whatever shit I was taking, even though it was probably, you know, even though there might be a truth and a lesson there, it was wrapped in negativity and fucking spite. And I would have to identify what the truth was and I had to ignore the spitefulness. And I don't suggest that you tolerate bullying. And I got to a point after about a year and a half where I'd learned a huge amount and I wasn't willing to tolerate that shit because it was quite personal. And I was like, listen, man, I'm going to move elsewhere because this is fucking bullshit. But I did go through it for a year and a half. 
And I, as a result of being in that place, I got astronomically better at what I did. And I fast tracked a lot of progress in a short amount of time. And the reason for that was my ability to learn, my ability to check my ego, my ability to just fucking accept, you know, that I can't take shit personally. If I take shit personally, I'm going to end up losing the plot and killing someone. So I may as well just shut the fuck up, keep your fucking head down and keep getting better and better and better and better. You know, and I did. I kept getting better and better and better. And within a couple of months, I was teaching the course that I'd just done. I was the head fucking coach, head shooter. Like all of those things happened in a short amount of time. And I always say that you have to be able to identify what's true and what's a fucking real thing that you can take on to improve instead of trying to focus on how this has offended me. Because if you focus on how you've been offended, you're never going to get better and you're never going to move forward. Never going to get better and never going to move forward. You got to know what you're willing to accept. Don't take me wrong. Don't accept being bullied by someone. Okay? Don't accept being bullied by someone. I wouldn't say I was being bullied. Maybe some people would categorize it as that. For me, I wouldn't say I was being bullied. I would say I was being spoken to extremely harshly, you know, and personally sometimes. But I would be able to still separate that and find the nuggets and find the gift in us, let's say. Now, what I want, the reason that I tell you that is that I want to convey to you and want to get across to you one thing, that being a martyr to the cause and being reactive to things that are being said to you will fuck you up in life, you know? And we all know people who are really stubborn and they don't listen and they don't take anything on board and they're not receptive to other people's opinions. And we know what a fucking nightmare those people are to be around, you know? Oh, well, I know that already. Sure, I know that. And it's like their ego can't accept a defeat, you know? The ego can't accept a defeat. You've really got to be conscious of that in yourself. If that's you and that's your mentality, I guarantee you, you're living life with a limiter on you, you know? You're living life in fucking third or fourth gear instead of fifth gear. That's the truth. And there's some really, 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 really good examples of this. Like any toxic habit, really, like because it's it's bad for you, it's bad for your health, it's bad for those around you. As is, you know, you know, drinking, gambling, smoking. So, like any toxic habit, the first thing you're going to have to do is accept it. Yeah, exactly. Um, like your your example there was the extreme example. Like I mean, you 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 know, you had you, you're a bigger man than I would have been in that situation. As soon as he raised his voice to me once. It wouldn't be about what his message was. I know that's not the point, but hmm. I know I know I know what you mean. But you do have to accept first. But that's that an example. Bad, bad attitude is toxic. Yeah. It is another toxic habit. The reason why you say habit is because you're not born like that. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and I think in that place, that's why I don't want people to take on that story and go, "Okay, so I should just be accept. I should accept being bullied." No, you shouldn't but if something could make you drastically better at what you do which is what that place was doing for me if it could make you drastically better you got to be able to you got to be able to fucking potentially just put your head down there's a book this book that i'm reading at the moment ego is the enemy is fucking lethal and there's some stuff in it and here's here's a really really good chapter for anyone that's ever thinking about actually doing it I'm trying to go back to it so basically, he tells this story of, you know, people, <clears throat> people in history that, especially at a young stage, basically, we, we think that we shouldn't suffer for what we do or to get better at something. We think we shouldn't have to suffer at all. And I think in a modern day sense, that's very, very true. But even in an old sense. So this guy talks about, and I'm trying to fucking find it. I might find it now in a sec. But... He basically oh, said, <clears throat> yeah, here we go. Cam searching for the page is sponsored by Chef. Oh, we know. Follow the canvas <laughs> strategy. So here's a quote. Lord man, I have no idea who that is. Great men have always shown themselves as ready to obey as they afterwards proved able to command. Okay, I'll say that again. Great men have always shown themselves that ready to obey as they have afterwards proved able to command. Um, and that was always my mentality going in. It's like, fuck, well, I've got to be able to show that I can follow orders and, and you know, fall in line and learn if I'm ever going to be good enough to lead the fucking charge. And this whole thing of what he says here, right, is in Roman times, in Roman times, there was a young writer called Petalus. And Petalus was 
basically spending most of his days as a patron to a rich man. Patron to a rich man. What that basically means is this young artist slash writer used to feed this rich man grapes, okay? And this rich man was someone who knew a lot about the craft, was a famous writer and artist himself. And Petalus basically wrote about how he could not stand, it was such a tragedy that someone as talented as him had to feed another rich man grapes or had to feed someone superior to him grapes. And he just, his whole life was what a fucking shambles this is and how terrible it is. And the whole point of the chapter is that that is ego at its best because it's actually part of the process that when you're starting off with something, you have to take a little bit of flack and potentially be willing to take on a bit of flack in order to get better. It's not that you take it on forever. You know, for you, like as a fucking experienced chef with 10 or 15 years in the industry, you shouldn't really be taking shit off people. You know what I mean? But for me, at the start of my career, I was young. I had to take it on board. For a lot of commie chefs, you have to we take all it. We You know, you have to be, and this, that, the idea of that chapter is that, you know, you have to be willing to feed the grapes to the fucking master for a while so you can actually pick up on what they're doing and try and, you know, absorb some of that for yourself. Because if you get ahead of yourself, and this is a problem in the world nowadays, with social media, you can call yourself whatever the fuck you like. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a CEO, I'm a fucking this, I'm a fucking that. You can be something that you're not. And you can, and with that, because you're telling yourself, I'm faking it till you make it, you mightn't have to actually go through the process to get good. And that's a real thing that a lot of people aren't willing to go through. So just bear that in mind, guys. Don't be a martyr to the cause. If there's a time and a place you're taking something on board, whether that's something that I've told you, or a fucking post, or something that someone else is telling you, try and absorb the fucking usefulness from it. You know? I think I used to say things in quite a harsh way because that's kind of how I communicate with people and it's not a personal thing. I would just say things very matter of fact if I felt that that was the truth. And I've had to learn how to you know, ease that off and come across as a bit nicer to get my point across. And even if you do get triggered by something I say, even if you do read a post and say, fuck you, you know, where you see a fuck you. It's like, yeah, good. It's like, take that on To get you taken. Yeah. Take it on board and try and fucking learn from it because that's all I'm doing it for is to fucking make you better, you know? It's to make you better and push you forward. And here's some good examples versus bad examples. Peter's a very good example. Liam is a good example, okay, in the group. Liam's one of the guys who joined ChefFit and he made a life-changing transformation. And he was in such a shit place before, such a terrible place where he just, he'd never made any kind of change before in his life, tried diets and failed at them. His energy was so fucked, he couldn't play with his kids, just out of a relationship. You know, there was a lot of fucking bad stuff going on, and he wasn't happy, and he wasn't in a good place, and physically, he was as worse as he's ever been. And when he jumped on board, he potentially could have had every reason to resist. He could have had every reason to call me a dickhead, because I had no social proof at the time i was just a guy who started chef fit i wasn't a guy who proven that chef fit works yet um he had every reason to not believe me but from the first day that we spoke he was very unsure of himself and then after that he had a bit of a conversation with himself and people said to him it's like no you should give it a shot like give it everything you have and thank fuck people said that to him because he did and he listened to everything and he would message me or call me and be like man i'm unsure of this you know, what, what do you think? And I give him my advice and he'd apply it and he'd fucking do it. And he did everything that was asked of him. He still does. Two years later, still fucking does everything he's asked of him. And the key thing was that he didn't let his feelings get muddled up in the facts. I told him facts. I told him what he needed to do. And he went and fucking did it and he was successful. However, I've also had people who, you know, have stepped in and have this mentality of, well, you know, I'll accept the advice, but only to a certain extent. And it's like, if I call someone out for not doing the work or acting a certain way because it's not congruent with being successful, oh, well, you don't understand and this and that. And it's like, okay, cool. Maybe I don't understand. Good luck with that. See how you get on. And what happens every single time without motherfucking fail is that these chefs will come in with that mentality, not take on what's being said, and then ultimately they won't do the work because they're believing their own bullshit and they go back to square one over and over and over again. And they think it's because the thing they tried didn't work. It's nothing to do with the thing that you tried. It's everything to do with you. If you're looking for the problem out there, you're the problem. That's a fact. You know, same thing with me behind the bar. The bad attitude. 
It's like, I thought everyone else was the problem. I became the problem as a result of that thinking. That's huge. That's a real problem. That's a real issue. So again, don't let yourself fall into that trap. If you are willing and receptive to information, if you have a positive attitude and you have a responsibility of your life and where it's going, you will be successful. But if you think that it's not your responsibility to fix, okay, which was, let's say, way back when, when I was taking some shit off that guy, it's like, well, my responsibility was I wanted to be fucking good at what I did and I wanted to be successful. So whatever it took to get there, I was willing to fucking do it. You know, so I was willing to take that on. That's my responsibility. Your responsibility might be you need to fix your life and your lifestyle and put things in a more structured, disciplined way so your health is sorted, your mental health is sorted, and your personal life is sorted. That could be why you're doing something. That's also your responsibility. So when that's your responsibility, you need to focus on the facts and the good things that get you to push across the line and pursue success as opposed to, oh, fuck, what did you say? No, that fucking hurt my feelings. Fuck you. It's like, don't do it. I had a shit, actually, to finish this off, one of those chefs, you might just think I'm talking shit, but I'm not. I had a chef message me two days ago, yesterday, a guy that was in the program <clears throat> and didn't listen, didn't listen in the program. And obviously, chef, it overwhelmingly, the majority of people are successful. The majority of chefs are successful. But like anything, you're going to have a handful. You're going to have a few, select few who think they know what they're talking about. And this guy thought he knew- Give what he, a man a hammer. Yeah, thought, and he thought he knew what he was talking about. And he came in and he was like, oh, well, I just need the group and I just need the accountability or whatever. And he wasn't even willing to accept the accountability. He just thought he wanted to be involved. So he got in and he thought he didn't have much to change. He thought that the other chefs were struggling more than he did. You know, and he was just kind of here to get a bit fitter, even though he was all over the shop in his personal life. And I tried to tell him the truth at every turn, you know what I mean, in a nice way. I was telling him the truth, and it's like, listen, man, I think you're massively complacent here. I don't think you're fucking, you know, I think your situation is potentially a bit worse than what you're letting on. Um, and if we really want to fix this, this is what I suggest that you do. And in that, it was like, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Didn't take anything on board. Didn't do follow through on anything I said. Um, and within about six months, he fucked off, you know, and he just stopped showing up. He didn't even tell us, to let us know that he left he just left and um i was like okay fucking whatever couldn't couldn't handle the fucking truth and i wasn't i wasn't being harsh at all i was just telling the truth and uh i get a message then yesterday of like you were right about everything and it's not about me being right but this guy was like you were right about everything um my life is fucked and it was down to my own complacency I thought I knew what I was talking about and I didn't know what I was talking about. I fucked a relationship. I fucked my job. Um, and, you know, all the things you were telling me about my, whether that was drug use, whether that was, you know, changing things around based on my opinion of things, all of those things ended up biting me in the fucking hole. And now I'm in the pit. And it's like, you know, obviously I'll talk through that and it's nothing, it's never personal. It's never personal. And I'll always talk that person through and fucking help them as best I can. And I'm doing that. But that was a real, that was probably the inspiration for this episode of just like, you know, I told you from the start that was going to happen. I told you, if you keep doing what you're doing, this is going to happen to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then continue to do the same old shit over and fucking over again. And then your life is fucked. Relationship fucked, lost your job, all of that shit. And the harsh truth is that's that person's fault, you know, because you didn't fucking listen when you should have listened. And the big character change is that the person has messaged and said, listen, this is, I fucked it. You know, absolutely fair enough. Fair play to you. I'll help you whatever way I can. You know what I mean? You've admitted the mistake and you can fucking learn from it. But, you know, if you just have that attitude of you know it all and no one can tell you shit, then, okay, cool. See where that gets you. Complacency is the undoing, and especially of men, I will say that again, especially of men, even though there's females out there that might be complacent, I don't think it's as much of a female tendency. Females, I think, are far more receptive to information. There's a male, a masculine thing where you have to know fucking everything, and you know, you have to be right all the time, which is a terrible male trait. And you know, if you're that person, 
you're going to be stuck. You're going to be fucking miserable. If you're receptive, you're going to have the attitude to push forward and learn new things and get better. And that's as simple as I can make it. So don't be that chef that fucking didn't listen to anything and ended up fucking themselves over. Be that chef who, you know, committed to themselves, was responsible for the outcome of their life and did whatever it took to fucking fix it and sort it out. Because if you have that mentality, like you're going to be happy. If you don't, it's game fucking set and match. That's don't be a dickhead. Don't be a wank biscuit. Um, that's the key, you know. Don't wank onto a biscuit and don't be a wank biscuit. Uh, and if you are going to wank onto a biscuit, don't be last. Yeah, and don't eat it. Whatever you do. Um, Unless you're last, then you have to man the fuck up and eat that biscuit. You fuck the up. last person to jip on the biscuit, get involved. <laughs> get involved. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in. Put it in the hard yards. So good. <laughs> Check the ego. <laughs> Check your ego. You know what you're getting into. Exactly. Eat the gypped biscuit. Um, <laughs> folks, that is our episode for today. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the episode. Um, and try, don't be the self fulfilling prophecy. I've probably said some shit you don't like. Fair enough. I get it. If I hurt your feelings, sorry. It's not intended to hurt your feelings, it's not intended to be personal. But if anything's a, sh- a sign, if you're triggered by this episode and you do nothing, like, you know exactly what I mean there. You're just, that, that's exactly what I warned against. But if you could take it and some of it sounds true to you and maybe there's a degree of, oh, well, fuck, maybe I do that sometimes and shit. Maybe I'll listen to that story you told of being in the restaurant and having an attitude. Maybe that's me. You know, if you seek to try and change those things and just try and think about situations differently and how you're coming across, you know, generally that will have a positive impact on your life. And if you could take that even further and take on information that drives your lifestyle in the right direction, fucking happy days. That's all I can ask for. Um, so yeah. Or if or if your chef mate has the actual problem, you can slip them this episode mm. on, under the guise of here, check out this episode of Chef It. Yeah. I did that with my comedy chef a couple of times. I was like, hey, make sure you check out Chef Hit this week. And then come in the next day, I go, you fucking, <laughs> you may as well call this episode David. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Back, shared around social media or on the old WhatsApp. Okay, guys, that's our episode for today. Thank you very much, Petey. Good night, my friend. Stay safe. Stay well. Peace out. Catch you soon.